Section twelve of Astounding Stories fourteen, February nineteen thirty one, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Black Lamp by Captain S. P. Meek. Part A. The clue, Carnes, said Dr. Bird slowly, lies in those windows. Operative Carnes of the United States Secret Service shook his head before he glanced at the windows of the famous scientist's private laboratory on the top floor of the Bureau of Standards. "'I usually defer to your knowledge, doctor,' he said, "'but this time I think you are off on the wrong foot. If the thieves came in through the windows, what was their object in cutting that hole through the roof? The marks are very plain, and they indicate that the hole was cut in some manner from the inside.' Dr. Bird smiled enigmatically. "'That is too evident for discussion,' he replied. "'I grant you that the thieves entered from the roof through that hole. After they had secured their booty, they left by the same route. I presume that you have noticed the marks on the roof where an aircraft of some sort, probably a helicopter, landed and took off. A question of much greater moment is that of what they did before they landed and cut the hole.' "'I don't follow your reasoning, doctor.' "'Carnes, that hole was cut through the roof with a heavy saw. In cutting it, the workers dislodged quite a little plaster which fell to the floor and must have made a great deal of noise. Why wasn't that noise heard? It was heard. The watchman heard it, but knew that Lieutenant Breslau was working here, and he thought he made the noise. Surely, but why didn't Breslau hear it? How do we know that he didn't? He was taken to Walter Reed Hospital this morning with his mind an absolute blank and with his tongue paralyzed. He must have seen the thieves, and they treated him in some way to ensure his silence. When he is able to talk, if he ever is, he'll probably give us a good description of them." Dr. Bird shook his head. "'Too thin, Carney, old dear,' he said. Breslau is a very intelligent young man. He was perfectly normal when I left him shortly after midnight last night. He was working alone in here on a device of the utmost military importance. On the desk is a push-button which sets ringing a dozen gongs in the building. Surely a man of that type would have had sense enough, when he heard and saw intruders cutting a hole through the roof, to sound an alarm which would have brought every watchman on the grounds to his assistance. He must have been knocked out before the hole was started, probably before the helicopter's landing. How? Gas of some sort? The windows were all closed and locked, and I have already ascertained that the gas and water lines have not been tampered with. Gas won't penetrate through a solid roof in sufficient concentration to knock out a man like that. It was something more subtle than gas. What was it? I don't know yet. The clue to what it was lies, as I told you, in those windows. Carnes moved over and surveyed the windows closely. I see nothing unusual about them except that they need washing rather badly. They were washed last Friday. But they do look rather dirty, don't they? Suppose you take a rag and some scouring soap and clean up a pane. The detective took the proffered articles and started his task. He wet a pane of glass, rubbed up a thick lather of scouring soap, and applied it and rubbed vigorously. With clear water he washed the glass, and then gave an exclamation of astonishment and examined it more closely. "'That isn't dirt, doctor,' he cried. "'The glass seems to be fogged.' Dr. Bird chuckled. "'So it seems,' he admitted. "'Now look at the rest of the glass around the laboratory.' Carnes looked around, and then walked to a table littered with apparatus, and examined a dozen pieces carefully. "'It's all fogged in exactly the same way, doctor,' he said. "'The only piece of clear glass in the room is that piece of plate glass on your desk.' Dr. Bird picked up a hammer and struck the plate on his desk a sharp blow. Carnes ducked instinctively, but the hammer rebounded harmlessly from the plate. "'That isn't glass, Carnes,' said the doctor. "'That plate is made of vitrilene a new product which I have developed. It looks like glass, but it has entirely different properties. It is of enormous strength and is quite insensitive to shock. It has one most peculiar property. While ultraviolet and longer rays will penetrate it quite readily, it is a perfect screen for X-rays and other rays of shorter wavelength. It appears to be the only piece of transparent substance in my laboratory which has not been fogged, as you call it. Do short waves fog glass, doctor? Not so far as I know at present, but you must remember that very little work has been done with the short wavelengths. In the vast range of waves whose lengths lie between zero and that of the X-ray, only a few points have been investigated and definitely plotted. There may be in that range a wavelength which will fog glass. 
then your theory is that some sort of a ray machine was put in operation before the helicopter landed it is too early to attempt any theorizing carnes let us confine ourselves to the known facts lieutenant breslau was normal at midnight and was working in this room some time between then and seven this morning he underwent certain mental and physical changes which prevent him from telling us what he observed during the same period a hole was cut in the roof and things of great importance stolen at the same time all the glass in the laboratory became semi-opaque the problem is to determine what connection there is between the three events i will handle the scientific end here but there is some outside work to be done and that will be your share give me your orders doctor said the detective briefly to understand what i am driving at i will have to tell you what has been stolen naturally this is highly confidential some rumors have leaked out as to my experiments with radite as i have named the new radium containing disintegrating explosive on which i have been working but no one short of the secretary of war and the chief of ordnance and certain of their selected subordinates knows that my experiments have been successful and that the united states is in a position to manufacture radite in almost unlimited quantities from the pitchblende ore deposits of wyoming and nevada the effects of radite will be catastrophic on the unfortunate victim on whom it is first used the only thing left to do was to develop a gun from which radite shells could be fired with safety and precision ordinary propellant powders are too variable for this purpose but i found that radite b one form of my new explosive can be used for propelling the shells from a gun the ordinary gun will last only two or three rounds due to the erosive action of the radite charge on the barrel and ordinary ordnance is heavier and more cumbersome than is necessary when this was found to be the case the chief of ordnance detailed lieutenant breslau the army's greatest expert on gun design to work with me in an attempt to develop a suitable weapon breslau is a wizard at that sort of work and he has made a miniature working model of a gun with a vitrilene lined barrel which is capable of being fired with a miniature shell the gun will stand up under the repeated firing of radite charges and is very light and compact and gives an accuracy of fire control heretofore deemed impossible from this he planned to construct a larger weapon which would fire a shell containing an explosive charge of two and one-half ounces of radite at a rate of fire of two hundred shots per minute the destructive effect of each cell will be greater than that of the ordinary high explosive shell fired from a sixteen-inch mortar and all of the shells can be landed inside a two hundred foot circle at a range of fifteen miles the weight of the completed gun will be less than half a ton exclusive of the firing platform it is breslau's working model which has been stolen carnes whistled softly between his teeth the matter will have to be handled pretty delicately to avoid international complications he said it's hard to tell just where to look there are a great many of nations who would give any amount for a model of such a weapon the matter must be handled delicately and also in absolute secrecy carnes we are not yet ready to announce to the world the fact that we have such a weapon in our armory it is the plan of the president to have a half dozen of these weapons manufactured and give a demonstration of their terrible effectiveness to representatives of the powers of the world think what an argument the existence of such a weapon will be for the furtherance of his plans for disarmament and universal peace public sentiment will force disarmament on the world for even the worst jingoist could no longer defend armaments in the face of america's offer to scrap these super engines of destruction and to destroy the plans from which they were made if the model has fallen into the hands of any civilized power the damage is not irreparable for public opinion would force its surrender and return it is among the uncivilized powers that our search must first be made that makes the problem of where to start more complicated on the contrary it simplifies it immensely at the head of the uncivilized powers stands one which has the brains the scientific knowledge and the manufacturing facilities to make terrible use of such a weapon in addition the aim of that power is to overthrow all world governments and to set up in their stead its own tyrannical disorder need i name it you refer to russia not to russia the great slumbering giant who will some day take her place in the sun in fellowship with the other nations but to bolsheviki that empire within an empire that horrible power which is holding sleeping russia in chains of steel and blood 
it is there that our search must first be made. Of course they have no official representative in America. No, but the Young Labour Party is as much their accredited representative as the British Ambassador is of Imperial Britain. Your first task will be to trail down and locate every leader of that group and to investigate his present activities. I can tell you where most of them are without investigation. Denberg, Semensky, and Karuska are in Atlanta. Fedorovich and Kasper are in Leavenworth. Saranoff is dead. Presumably. Why, doctor, I saw with my own eyes the destruction of the submarine in which he was riding. Did you see his dead body? No. Neither did I. And I will never be sure until I do. Once before we were certain of his death, and he bobbed up with a new fiendish device. We cannot eliminate Saranoff. I will include him in my plans. Do so. Besides a hypothetical Saranoff, there are a half a dozen or more of the old leaders of the gang who are alive and at liberty, so far as we know. They fled the country after the Coast Guard broke up their alien smuggling scheme, but some of them may have returned. There are also thirty or forty underlings who should be located and checked up on, and, in addition, we must not lose sight of the fact that new heads of the organization may have been smuggled into the United States. It is no simple task that I am setting you, Carnes, but I know that you and Bolton will see it through if anyone can. Thanks, Doctor. We'll do our best. If I am not speaking out of turn, what are you planning to do in the meantime? I am going to start Taylor off on an ultra-short wave generator and try a few experiments along that line. Breslau is at Walter Reed, and they are doing all they can for him. But until I can get some definite information as to the underlying cause of his condition, they are more or less shooting in the dark. How are they treating him? By electric stimulations and vibratory treatments. And by keeping him in a darkened room. By the way, Carnes, if I am correct in my line of thought, it would be well to have an extra guard put over Karuska. He was the only real expert in ordnance that the young Labour Party had, and if they have Breslau's model, they'll need him to supervise the construction of a gun. I'll attend to that at once, Doctor. Is there anything else? Not that I know of. I am going out to Tacoma Park this afternoon and have another look at Breslau, but it is too soon to hope for any change in his condition. Aside from the time I will be out there, you can find me either here or at my home, in case anything develops. I'll get on the job at once, Doctor. Thanks, old dear. Remember that speed must be the keynote of your work. The telephone bell at the head of Dr. Bird's bed woke into noisy activity. The doctor roused himself and took down the instrument sleepily. A glance at the clock showed him that it was four in the morning, and he muttered a malediction on the one who had called him. Hello, he said into the receiver. Dr. Bird speaking. Doctor, came a crisp voice over the wire. Wake up. This is Carnes talking. Something has broken loose. All trace of sleep vanished from Dr. Bird's face, and his eyes glowed momentarily with a peculiar glitter which Carnes would at once have recognized as indicative of the keenest interest. What has happened, Carnes? he demanded. I telephoned Atlanta this morning and arranged to have an extra guard put over Karuska as you suggested. The matter was simplified by the fact that he and nine others were confined in the prison infirmary. The warden agreed to do as I told him, and, in addition to the regular guards, a special man was placed in the ward near Karuska's bed. At two a.m. the lights in the ward went out. Accidentally, or were they put out? They haven't found out yet. At any rate, they are all right now. But Karuska and all of the other inmates and all the guards of that particular ward have gone crazy. The Dickens, you say? Not only that, they are also partially paralyzed. The description I got over the telephone corresponds exactly with the condition of Lieutenant Breslau as you described it to me. Here is the most interesting part of the whole affair. The special guard over Karuska was only lightly affected and has already recovered and is in a position to tell you exactly what happened. I got a garbled account of the affair from the warden, something about a goldfish bowl or something like that. The warden wouldn't take it seriously enough to give me details. I didn't press for them much for I knew that you would rather get them at first hand. I certainly would. I'll be ready to leave for Atlanta in less than ten minutes. I expected that, doctor, and a car is already on its way to pick you up. 
I'll meet you at Langley Field, where a plane is already being tuned up, and will be ready to take off by the time we get there. Good work, Carnes. I'll see you at the field. A car was waiting for Carnes and Dr. Bird when the Langley Field plane slid down to a landing at Atlanta. At the penitentiary, Dr. Bird went direct to the infirmary where Karuska had been confined. As he entered, he shot a keen glance around and gave an exclamation of satisfaction. "'Look at the windows, Carnes,' he cried. Carnes went over to the nearest window and moistened his fingertip and applied it experimentally to the glass. The moisture produced no effect, for the glass of the windows was permanently clouded, as was that of the doctor's laboratory. "'Whatever happened in my laboratory the night before last was repeated here last night with a similar object,' said the doctor. "'The object there was to steal a gun model. Here it was to steal a man who could construct a full-sized gun from the model.' I understand that one of the guards escaped the fate which overtook the rest of the persons in the infirmary? Not altogether, doctor, replied the warden. I think that his mind is somewhat affected, for he tells a wild yarn and insists on trying to wear a goldfish bowl on his head. I have him under observation in the psychopathic ward. Dr. Bird shot a scornful glance at the warden. There are none so blind as those who will not see, he murmured. "'By all means, I wish to see him,' he went on aloud. "'Will you have him brought here at once, please?' The warden nodded and spoke to one of the attendants. In a few moments a tall, fair-haired young giant stood before the doctor. Dr. Bird pushed back his unruly shock of black hair with his fingers, those long, slim, mobile fingers which alone betrayed the artist in his make-up, and shot a piercing glance from his black eyes into the blue ones, which returned the gaze unabashed. "'What is your name?' he asked. "'Bailey, sir. "'You were on guard here last night?' "'Yes, sir. "'I was detailed as a special guard over number 9764. "'Tell me in your own words just what happened. "'Don't be afraid to speak out. "'I'm not going to disbelieve you. "'And above all, tell me everything, "'no matter how unimportant it may seem to you. "'I'll judge the importance of things for myself. "'I'm Dr. Bird of the Bureau of Standards.' "'The guard's face lighted up at the doctor's words.' End of Part A